Earth has a unique natural satellite and it benefits life on our planet in multiple ways. According to secular scientists, our moon was formed in a random event billions of years ago when a giant object hit the Earth. But there is strong evidence against this claim. Not only that, our moon is unusual in many ways, has multiple lines of evidence for youth, and is well designed to support life on Earth and fulfill its stated purposes as described in the Bible. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Our Design Moon with Spike Pasaris. Hello, welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. We have a great show for you today. Our guest, Spike Basaris, has a degree in electrical engineering and has done graduate work in physics. He was formerly an engineer in the United States military space program. He is an author and popular speaker on astronomy and related topics. Spike founded Creation Astronomy and has produced many fascinating videos defending a young earth view as related in the Bible. Welcome to the program, Spike. Thank you for having me, Ray. So I love this graphic. We're going to be talking about the moon, our design moon. Yes. In other words, God made the moon. Yes, for specific reasons and purposes. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Familiar verse to us, I would hope. And it also says that these objects had specific purposes. The sun is described as the greater light to rule the day, whereas the moon is described as the lesser light to rule the night. And the Bible also tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. So we can trust from all these verses that we should be able to look at objects in the sky and perceive God's glory through them and that they fulfill the purposes that he had in making them. Conversely, of course, in our culture, this is not a popular viewpoint. Uh, there are secular scientists who talk about models for how these objects got there through natural processes billions of years ago. And the popular model today for the origin of the solar system, and thus the planets and moons within it, is called the solar nebula model. The idea that billions of years ago there was a swirling cloud of gas and dust that then condensed into rocks which made planets and so on. So you would think then that if that were the case, these objects would not look like they were designed. They would look like the outcome of random natural processes. So it's an interesting study then to look at these objects in this light and look at various features of them and say, what do they look like? Do they look like the outcome of natural processes or do they show actually evidence of design? And in this show, we're gonna focus on the moon specifically. Uh, it's an area that is often underappreciated, I think, when people talk about origins uh, because the moon's a very familiar object to us. We see it frequently, uh, but we don't actually realize that it's actually unique in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, the moon is uniquely supportive of life on Earth. The moon and the sun together raise tides in the Earth's oceans, and these tides actually turn out to be important in life on Earth. The tides help ocean water to circulate, and without the tides doing that, the ocean waters would risk becoming stagnant, which of course would be bad for life. Uh, now, if the moon were much closer than it currently is, the tides would be stronger and larger, and they could be destructive to the continental coastlines. But the moon is at just the right size and just the right distance to produce these beneficial tides and indeed to support the global food chain. Uh, much of the food chain actually originates in the oceans and were the moon not doing this role, then the earth might be much less conducive to life than it currently is. There's other features of the moon that you could argue were meant specifically for, for humanity. For example, the way the moon orbits the earth, it turns out that every year in the autumn, there's what's, what's called a harvest moon where there's several evenings in the autumn where the moon rises right after sunset and, and provides bright moonlight at that time. And throughout history, farmers have found that very beneficial to have extra light during harvest time because their workday, you know, the longer it is, the more they can get done, of course. On a broader scale, we see that the moon actually stabilizes the rotation of the Earth. Over long periods of time, the Earth's rotation axis would risk wobbling, if you will, precession, um, but the moon actually has a stabilizing influence on the axial tilt of the Earth. 
Now, this isn't something that would manifest itself over short periods of time, uh, like 6,000 years or so since creation. But if you want to believe in longer periods of time, as a secular community does, then even they have to admit this is actually a very beneficial feature for life here on Earth. Furthermore, the moon is uniquely explored among all the objects in our solar system, other than the Earth, of course. I mean, we, men have actually walked on it. We can't say that about anything else at this point. If you look back during the Apollo era, there was actually three competing theories, three competing secular theories specifically, for where the moon came from. The fission theory, the nebula theory, and the capture theory. Uh, the fission theory says that the moon split off from the Earth early in Earth's history. The nebula theory says that the moon and Earth formed from a cloud of gas at the same time. And the capture theory says that the moon formed somewhere else and then got captured by the Earth's gravity. Well, actually, nobody got what they wanted because the Apollo missions wound up disproving all three theories. The astronauts brought back a lot of samples with them and other things that were going on at the time led to the realization that none of those three theories were correct. When we actually could get up to the moon and check out the evidence, none of them pan out. None of them they all out. have to be wrong. Right. So what do they do? So for a time in the mid-70s, they actually didn't have any workable theory. Uh, mid to late 70s, another idea came along, now called the giant impact hypothesis, that said early in the Earth's history, a large body the size of Mars, roughly, came along and hit the Earth, made a lot of debris that sprayed up into space. Some of it came back down, but the rest of it stayed up there and formed the moon. Now, when this idea was first proposed, a lot of people didn't like it, even in the secular community, because it required very finely chosen parameters. You needed an object of exactly the right size coming in at exactly the right speed and angle for this even to be possible. And even then, there were some problems with the idea. Nevertheless, this idea got popular. And if you look today in a textbook or even on Wikipedia, like we have here, uh, this Wikipedia page, you'll be told that the giant impact hypothesis is currently the favored scientific hypothesis for the formation of the moon. Some people have argued it's too contrived to even be workable. And even some secular scientists have pointed this out. As this author said, it is difficult to reconcile giant impact models with the compositional similarity of the Earth and moon without violating angular momentum constraints. Without going into details about the jargon here, he's saying that the physics doesn't work. This author pointed out that the collision has to be implausibly gentle. You practically need someone to hold a Mars-sized object just above Earth and drop it to avoid messing up Earth's orbit. Yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, something that size hitting the Earth, the Earth is going to be completely knocked out of whack. Right. And but yet today we have a near-perfect circular orbit. You wouldn't expect that to be the outcome of such a collision like this, would you? And this is actually Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt, who is a PhD geologist gathering samples. Of course, in the 70s, uh, NASA and other agencies analyzed the materials that were brought back and discovered a lot of things from them. But more recently, uh, early 2000s, scientists said, you know, our lab technology is better now than it was 30 plus years ago. Maybe they missed something back then. So they went back and reanalyzed a lot of the samples and discovered that in some of the volcanic glass in the soils that were brought back, turns out there's trace amounts of water. Now this was surprising because water shouldn't be in the moon had this collision happened. And it's important, by the way, that this is in the volcanic glass. If soil from the moon had water in it, you could say maybe it came from a comet or a meteorite after the moon formed. But volcanic glass was emitted from inside the moon. So if the volcanic glass contains water, that means the moon's interior contains water as well. And that's where the collision says it should not be. As this scientist commented, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which a giant impact melts completely the moon and at the same time allows it to hold on to its water. That's a really, really difficult knot to untie. So it's so hot that rock is melted yeah. and water somehow survives. Right. Which we know <laughs> would be completely gone long before the rocks Exactly. Gone. Yeah. Further investigations show there's even more water than initially thought. As this article points out, 100 times more water than initially thought. Turns out there's actually enough water in the moon that if you were to raise it all to the surface, you'd have a global ocean of water about a meter deep. I mean, there's a lot of water <laughs> represented there. So really, this collision has been discredited. Even some scientists in the secular community admit this, as, as we saw. But it's still being taught in schools and textbooks on Wikipedia and wherever else. Why is that? Because they don't have any other suggestion. Now, is that good science education? No. <laughs> <laughs> to teach a model that is we known. Know it's wrong, but that's the best you have, so we'll teach what we know is wrong. Right. Not a good approach. Moving on, we could talk about the moon's purposes in providing signs and seasons for us on Earth. And the moon is actually uniquely positioned for this. 
So I'm showing here a, a photograph of a solar eclipse when the moon passes in between the Earth and the sun. And here's a little animation of how that happens. So when the moon does this, it casts a shadow on the Earth. And if you're in the shadow at the right time and place as it passes through, then you will see the moon cover the disk of the sun and produce one of these eclipses, transitioning here from an animation to a photograph. Now, we tend to take these for granted. Um, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun is, yet it's 400 times closer to us than the sun is, which means from our perspective, the disk of the sun and the moon are pretty close to being exactly the same size. So when everything lines up correctly, the moon can perfectly cover up the disk of the sun briefly, which produces these eclipses, and also makes some interesting science possible, by the way, because we can see the corona as in this photograph that we normally wouldn't uh, be able to perceive. So a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller moon, or a little bit further, a little bit closer, and you wouldn't get the full Or in a eclipse. different orbit with the way everything, it all has to work out wow. exactly correctly. Now, question here is, there's other moons in the solar system besides our moon. In fact, there's over 200 moons throughout the solar system. Of all of the moons in the solar system, how many have the correct combination of size, mass, distance, orbit to produce one of these events for an observer on the surface? I mean, 200, you would think there would have to be a couple, maybe 10, 20. It, yeah, there's one. <laughs> Our moon is the only one that will produce events like this for the planet that it orbits. And as an astronomer friend of mine commented, isn't it an amazing coincidence, he's tongue, saying this tongue in cheek, yeah. <laughs> that the only place where these events are observable is also the only place where there are observers to observe them. Where God said it's for signs and for seasons. Exactly. And, hmm. Now when you talk about origins, of course, everyone wants to know how old are these things that we're looking at. And the moon is said to be billions of years old. It formed more or less after the Earth did, a bit afterwards, supposedly. And one of the arguments for the long age view is supposed to be crater equilibrium. So crater equilibrium means that the surface of an object has been saturated with craters. So that if something new comes in and blasts out a new crater, it will also destroy an old one. And this is said to prove an old age for the moon because it would have taken long periods of time for the moon to have accumulated all of the craters that we see. But that makes an assumption about cratering rates in the past. I mean, it's true that today craters form very slowly. There's not many new impacts happening to form new craters. But is it valid to extend that backwards in time and say that it's always been this slow? Well, that's a good question. And to get some insight of that, we can look at what are called the maria on the surface of the moon. So the near side of the moon has these large dark areas on it that we can see from Earth. Interestingly enough, the far side doesn't have these, only the near side. So what are these big dark areas? Well, they're called maria, which means seas, uh, as an ocean. And they're large impact basins on the surface of the moon where something blasted out a very large crater essentially and then material came out from inside of the moon and filled it in. And I'm actually going to go up to the screen and illustrate this a little more clearly. So in this photograph we see there's several different kinds of terrain on the moon. So we see rugged highlands back here and we see smooth terrain here. Now this is uh, the edge of one of the maria that we just saw on that previous photograph. So apparently some large object hit the moon in this location, blasted out this big impact basin, and then lava came up from inside the basin and filled it all in and smoothed it out. That's why this is smooth now, and this area here that wasn't affected is still rugged as it is. Notice too there's some craters here that formed after the maria were filled in. We'll, we'll talk more in a moment about why that's important. Now here is the usual explanation for how all of this happened. And I'm showing you a video from NASA here, so of course this will be from the secular perspective. So it's gonna say billions of years and so on. Uh, I don't accept the billions of years, but even their ages I think are very revealing about some of the issues surrounding this as we'll see in a moment. So they would believe that the moon started out in a molten state roughly four and a half billion years ago, as you see here. And then of course over time it would cool. Then there would be peri a period of heavy bombardment. The secular community believes that there's been one or perhaps two periods of heavy bombardment where objects were roaming through the solar system, striking objects and doing a lot of these uh, catastrophic impacts. And they would say that because we don't see these things happening today. And so the first one that is believed to have happened is a large one at the south pole of the moon. Now here's one of the key points I'm making. The basin formation is part of the heavy bombardment 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. So large bodies hit the moon and blasted out these huge basins. 
Now, the creation community would, would agree that large objects hit the moon and formed these basins. We disagree on the timing. Um, but if you, even from the secular perspective, if you look at how they time all of this, it's interesting. So the basins formed, cracked the moon's crust, which would imply Mare Vulcanism starting from 3.8 billion years ago, where lava oozed out from the cracks and filled in the basins. Now that number came and went fairly quickly, but the key point was the impact started about 4 billion years ago. The lava coming out didn't start until 3.8 billion years ago, which is 200 million years later, and continued up to 1 billion years. So this means that some, these basins were formed by large catastrophic impacts, cracked the moon's crust, but then the moon waited for a couple hundred million years before the lava came out of the cracks and filled in the basins. Does that sound like a reasonable yeah, that sequence of these sound events? Like, uh, the little bit that I know of the laws of physics, when you crack something that's got magma inside it, it's coming out. And it's it's going to come away. out immediately. So why do they believe this? Well, this is the logical conclusion of their long age assumptions, and that's what I want to focus on now. So in this image here, we're seeing a photograph of one section of one of the moons, Maria, and we see here several examples of what are called ghost craters. So what are ghost craters? Well, these craters here are not ghost craters. This one and this one, you see these are sharp and clear. So these craters formed after the Maria was filled in by this lava that hardened into stone. We also see, though, some other craters like this one and this one and some other sm uh, smaller relics here and there, like down here. These craters are peeking up from the floor of that basin. So these craters existed before the lava came out and filled in, partially, these craters. So here's the sequence of events. First, the, the impact happened, blasted out this big basin. Then smaller impacts happened on the floor of the basin, forming these craters. Then the lava came and filled the basins in, filling in most of them, but only partially obscuring these ghost craters. And then the, as the final stage, these other ones happened at the, at the very end. So these ones here aren't important. The ones I'm focusing on here are these, because the moon has a lot of ghost craters in its maria. In this one here, uh, we can see one big one here. We can see one here. We see smaller ones scattered through, even some little things here and here, like poking up from below this, lo this lava that has filled in the maria. So, so because they're committed to the long, slow processes way of thinking, they, they believe that cratering has to be a slow process. Therefore, there had to be a long gap of time between the basin being blasted out and then being filled in. So you see, by looking at ghost craters and what this tells us about cratering rates in the past, this removes this argument that the moon must be old because it has accumulated so many craters by now. Well, Spike, off to stop you right there. The evidence does not show that the moon is old, but is there evidence to show that the moon is young? Stay with us after these messages. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Spike Pissaris, who's been sharing about our designed moon. All right, Spike, we've seen that the evidence does not support an old Earth, but we really haven't 
shown that it does support a young moon. There are other things we can look at that will shed a little more light on that particular aspect of this. So for example, the moon is a small body. That means it would cool off quickly after its formation, relatively quickly compared to a planet or something. Now if the moon were billions of years old, it therefore should have cooled off long ago. That would imply then that today we would no longer see geological activity in the moon. That would have stopped long ago because there's no source of energy to keep powering geological activity. However, for quite some time, there have been reports of what are called TLPs, transient lunar phenomena. Some of these go back to the 1500s, um, so long, many centuries of observations. Now, as you might guess by the name, these transient phenomena are very short-lived, if you will. Uh, people will see a glow or a flash of light or something along those lines on the moon. Now, for a long time, the secular community kind of ignored these reports because by their nature, you can't replicate them. You don't know when they're going to happen, so you can't be you know, waiting to see it when it happens. But finally, in 1968, NASA issued a technical, technical report, Chronological Catalog of Reported Lunar Events, with 579 different entries cataloging uh, all of these reported sightings. Once we got there with spacecraft and then with even human exploration, more evidence along these lines has been accumulating. For example, one of the Apollo missions measured radon gas coming from the Aristarchus crater. More recently, there's been an intensive study of a lot of the scarps on the moon's surface. Now, a scarp is a long um, change in elevation like you see here. Basically, a cliff would be a more conventional word to use here. It turns out that a lot of the scarps on the moon's surface, not all of them, but many of them, are associated with moonquakes that are being measured. That would indicate that these are actually active tectonic faults, which means there's ongoing geological activity going on inside of the moon. Now, this doesn't make sense from the secular perspective because the moon is supposed to be old and should have cooled off, shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff anymore. As this author said, the whole idea that a 4.6 billion year old rocky body like the moon has managed to stay hot enough in the interior and produce this network of faults just flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Because it's a pretty straightforward chain of reasoning here. Small body, no independent source of energy should have cooled off shouldn't have the heat to be tectonically active, but apparently it is. Other studies have looked at what are called wrinkle ridges on the moon. These apparently formed when the moon was cooling down, and as it cooled down, it shrank a little bit, and so these ridges formed. One recent study showed these wrinkle ridges might still be forming. That would mean the moon as an overall body is still cooling off, which again, it shouldn't be if it were actually billions of years old. Also discoveries of fresh volcanic deposits. Now, these should have stopped happening over a billion years ago, yet they're apparently still happening very recently at least, if not even today. As this author commented, this finding is the kind of science that is literally going to make geologists rewrite the textbooks about the moon. This is a NASA project scientist. So we see all this evidence for geological activity that apparently is at least happening recently, if not actually ongoing today, that shouldn't be happening at all if the moon were actually billions of years old. Now, if the moon's just thousands of years old, this isn't a problem. It's still cooling off after its recent creation. But the billions of years old mindset has a real challenge explaining these phenomena. Another interesting thing is going back to the Apollo missions. One of the things that's been studied since then is lunar recession. Turns out the moon is actually moving away from the Earth slowly over time. And this was anticipated at the time of the Apollo missions, which is one of the reasons the Apollo astronauts brought up with them equipment to run this particular experiment called LLR, Lunar Laser Ranging. So you see here one of these reflectors that was left behind on the moon's surface. This is basically a very sophisticated mirror that will reflect light back in the direction it came from. Apollos 11, 14, and 15 actually left behind these reflectors on the surface. So scientists on Earth can fire a laser at these reflectors, and if they manage to hit them, which is challenging to do as you can imagine, but they are able to do this, the light bounces back and they can measure how long it took the light to get from here to there and back, which allows for a very precise measurement of how far away the moon was at that moment. And this has been going on since the Apollo era, so decades now, and we have verified what was already anticipated to be the case, that the moon is actually moving slowly away from the Earth over time. So what do I mean by slowly? It's only about an inch and a half per year, which isn't much. But it's interesting because if you work it backwards in time, it's a challenge for the long age mindset. So why is this happening? First of all, let me just take a brief moment. 
As the moon goes around the Earth, its gravity pulls on the Earth's oceans, and the oceans bulge towards the moon. Uh, we call that a tidal bulge, and it's actually how we experience tides, because we rotate in and out of the bulge. But the, there's some friction between the Earth rotating beneath the bulge, so the Earth's rotation pulls the bulge forward a little bit. That mass of ocean water then exerts a separate gravitational pull on the moon, which accelerates it sideways a little bit and pulls it forward in its orbit, which means the moon is slowly moving away. And Apollo confirmed, again, it's about an inch, inch and a half per year, more or less. I mean, as we look at this, this object in the sky, again, we tend to take it for granted and not really think about a lot of this stuff. But we saw that the secular community teaches that this object formed by a random event billions of years ago, this impact, uh, and that this moon has been cooling off since then, not a whole lot going on. Instead, we see evidence against the collision. Even their own model doesn't match the water and such that we see within it. We see arguments ag against their way of looking at cratering and other long age measurements. And we also see these other things that would argue for youth. R recent volcanic activity in the moon isn't part of their playbook, so to speak. The Works moon. great for us, doesn't match their, their model. The moon is a great argument for the truth of scripture. Absolutely. Well, Spike, I want to thank you for being on the program. I hope you'll join us again. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us. On today's program, we saw that the arguments that the moon is billions of years old are not supported by the evidence. But this same evidence does support the biblical account of the moon being only thousands of years old. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof really is all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time right here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2406, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.